on the microphone as well, but I think this is just fine. Um, welcome to the, conf the FAMC conference, and our first speaker in the water and climate room is going to be Jamie Stanley. He's going to be talking about the climate change effects on water quantity and quality in the northern forest. So, please. Thank oh. you. Looks like the top's cut off. Is there anything we can do? Uh, can I have someone climb up there? And <laughs> <laughs> can we just... I just well, to... <clears throat> okay. So uh, I was really kind of excited to, to get this talk together because I've kind of been working in this area for quite a while, um, doing biogeochemistry and forested watersheds and looking at climate as one of the variables that you know we need to look at to understand the biogeochemistry and hydrology. But now my work is really going in this direction because my I'm researching the terrestrial part of the global carbon cycle, and uh, we and look at the climatic effects on, on how that might shift. Now, the terrestrial to aquatic carbon transfer is one of the big unknowns, or one of the largest uncertainties in the global climate or global carbon budget, and uh, that's kind of our charge is to help better understand that. So, looking at how climate's affecting that is going to be really important moving forward. So, I want to. Quick, do a quick overview of the way climate's been going in the Northeast. The plenary speakers this morning covered that pretty well, um, and how it's you know what the projections look like, and talk about it affects the climate on water quality, um, and particularly hone in on this precip intensity that, that's going to be increasing in the role of evapotranspiration and then get into some of the water quality aspects of how climate might affect water quality. Um, I won't dwell on the uh, schematic of the water cycle very long, but I just want to point out that uh, while I have this up, that evapotranspiration, globally, this is a bigger flux than this. In other words, evapotranspiration globally is more than the sum flow of all the rivers of the world. So that's why I'm going to spend a little time talking about how climate might impact it. Um, so I, all well, my titles are cut off, but um, <clears throat> I, well, I, I got this, the, the new climate assessment that everyone was talking about this morning. I had no idea that so many people would be talking about it, and I, I was excited. Oh, I have this resource. I can get some nice slides. Fortunately, I picked a lot of different ones that people showed this morning. This actually is not quite, oh, the bottom is cut off too, okay. But um, this is kind of just how temperature has changed in the past and showing again the northern U.S. and the northeast are hot spots. Um, and here's a figure from the report showing uh, projected changes and you're probably familiar with all these different CO2 scenarios people have. The, orange being kind of the business as usual if we keep increasing CO2. And that lower green one is sort of the best case scenario if we're able to, to cut back uh, probably the best case we can uh, where our temperature might stabilize pretty soon. But we're looking at quite a large increase in temperature. And <clears throat> despite what some people are saying, uh, it's pretty clear that humans are causing this increase. Uh, solar variation and solar activity is very small. Volcanoes have a small negative effect because of the, the aerosols in the air that they put out and uh, deflect incoming radiation. And just uh, look at, you, you've heard about how the increases in temperature are going to be greater the further north you go and this sort of depicts it pretty well. And again, this is a lower CO2 scenario on the left and higher on the right. So you see New England, our area is kind of in the middle of that bigger increase. And here's a pretty compelling figure from the report of, early, of the shift in frost dates. So this is left uh, the last frost in the spring and on the right the first frost in the fall. And each of those is projected to shift by 30 days, giving like a two month longer uh, growing season in the uh, in the worst case scenario, and a uh, <clears throat> bunch of precip. Uh, this is sort of how climate has changed, and uh, 
precip has not changed a great deal, but all of these metrics are about precip intensity. And I won't dwell on this, but just to say that the intensity has increased the most in the Northeast. All these percentage changes from the, the base, the whole period, are greatest in the Northeast. Um, what is this? I can read it. Why does, precipit why does precipitation increase as climate warms? The atmosphere holds more water, about 7% more water for each degree Celsius of warming. So the potential is there for greater um, rainfall or precipitation. And evaporation increases, so that's a source for more precipitation, but we can run out of water. So, I mean, Phoenix has not a lot of rainfall, even though it has a lot of capacity to hold moisture. So it really depends on the water availability as well. But by and large, if you are in a wetter area, like we're in a fairly humid area, we have potential for a pretty good increase in precip just because of that physical capability of the atmosphere. Um, so these are peak flow trends, actual peak flows across the U.S. And again, the northeast is kind of a hot spot for where flows really are increasing. And so here's my little attempt at artwork of showing how the hydrograph is, it really is already shifting and likely to continue to shift in that direction. So the, the light blue uh, trace I call the good old days where the snowpack sits around for a good length of time. You can get your skiing in and then when it's time to get on your bicycle, it's finally starting to melt. You have a pretty good sized peak and that late and large peak extends well into the summer and sustains uh, base flow well into the summer months. Um, this is idealized, of course. There are storms that should be teeth on top of that plot, but that's sort of the general trace of what the hydrology looks like here in the Northeast. And the yellow one is kind of the direction we're moving in with lower snowpacks. You get an earlier melt and you don't have that driver those high groundwater tables to sustain that base flow into the summer and it peters off and in this case it went right off the plot. <laughs> but I can see it. Um, so here's a slide I got from my colleague Doug Burns who's been doing a lot of work on this in New York State and uh, we have this metric we hydrologists like to use called the um, winter spring center of volume. And that's the day on which all of the flow from January 1st to May 31st, uh, the day on which half of that flow has passed your stream gauge. And so it's kind of a measure of the timing of snowmelt. And this plot on the bottom depicts how that date has gotten earlier and earlier since the 1960s. So day 90, Julian day 90 would be about the 1st of April. And we see that, and th these are just different regions of New York State. We can see how that's moved down to now about the middle of March, or at least late March, <clears throat> 20th or so. But that's, that's a significant change, and that's projected to increase, or to get earlier and earlier, and maybe even accelerate. So that, that sort of is the, the real world data that backs up my artwork. So in general, this is, kind of what's been happening. We have had about a 2% centigrade increase in the last century and a slight increase in precipitation. That's about five inches. Um, but the big thing is the intensity, as I mentioned. But because of this increase in precipitation, what used to be a 100-year storm is now about a 60-year storm. And that was an assessment of 10 years ago that's probably even shortened by now. So kind of a few bullets on the future climate outlook. We are looking at an even larger increase in air temperature. Small, a small increase in annual precip, but more intense. Um, and there's, there's less certainty about the precip, precipitation. And then this, and it's gonna be more variable, this phenomenon that they're in the Midwest, they started calling weather whiplash, where you go from these huge floods to the next thing you know, it's the driest summer ever. Um, and we just see a lot more bouncing back and forth from extremes now. So this one's called future, wait, future, oh, it's just a continuation. Future, and uh, some more bullets on future climate outlook, increase in extreme rain events, kind of said that. 
like a double whammy, bigger floods, but more intense droughts. Rain will fall on drier soil during the warm weather season. Snow will diminish, so we'll have fewer rain on snow events. But not all the flood signals are pointing in the same direction because there's a lot of spatial variability. It, it does depend a little bit on what you are, where you are. So this one's called evapotranspiration, up or down. Um, <clears throat> so again, thinking back to our, my water cycle slide where evapotranspiration is really a huge part of the water budget. So we really want to think about what's going to happen with that because the, what goes off in stream flow is what's left over after the evapotranspiration. So what might be driving it up? Well, the longer growing season we've talked about, uh, the higher CO2 in the atmosphere actually has a fertilization effect on the forest because it's driving more photosynthesis. Um, when we have warmer and wetter climate, we'll have more degradation of dissolved organic matter, which releases nitrogen, which also gives the forest more nutrition and inspires it to grow faster and give off uh, more water, transpire more water. But driving ET down will be, so the photosynthesis, the water use is not quite linear, and Mark Green will be talking about this next, but um, the decreased stomatal conductance and increased water use efficiency will actually have a negative effect on ET. Um, and ET is limited by water availability, so we usually in this part of the world do not get to the wilting point where the trees just don't get enough water, but we may get to that point. So that too could limit increases in ET. So I have one example from my research area in Sleepers River. Uh, and this is a, a, an interesting example of where our trends of precipitation are going up on the left plot. I also have Hubbard Brook on here in yellow, but the Sleepers River in the Northeast Kingdom is uh, in the blue, it, precipitation is increasing, but our groundwater levels are generally going down. Now, how can that happen? Well, <clears throat> our leading hypothesis on this is off the screen, but uh, <laughs> we uh, surmise that because of this increase in rainfall intensity, that a lot of the rainfall, instead of recharging groundwater like it normally would do, the higher intensity means we're getting a higher percentage of that running off. So even though we're getting more rain, a higher amount of it's running off and there's less around to uh, recharge the groundwater. And I have three minutes to talk about water quality unless I eat into my question time. So the title of this is Water Quality. <laughs> um, and the title of this is Sleepers River Research Watershed. So this is my main uh, research site in the Northeast Kingdom. You can see the square up there. It's actually just really close to St. Johnsbury, right about there. And we do most of our work, though, in the headwater catchment way up on the upper left side. And there's a blow up of that on the left. So a lot of the next few slides are going to be from this research watershed. And we're doing a lot of work. This title is called DOC Dynamics. We do a lot of work with dissolved organic carbon and kind of one of my favorite plots there in the lower left, the blue dots are what the DOC concentration is uh, at base flow on our weekly samples. That's this day of year is the x-axis. And the yellow dots are all the storm events we sample. So DOC has this tremendous uh, uh, dynamic behavior where it increases with, with stream flow. And so think of climate change, increased flows, that alludes to higher and higher DOC concentrations. And here in the lower right is actually our trend in DOC concentration from the early 90s to present. It's gone up by about 25 to 30%, and that's the concentration. The flow has also gone up by 20 to 30%, so we've more than doubled our DOC export. And there's just a nice picture of how the, the water goes from clear to looking very, very brown during high flow. Um, this one's called <clears throat> Colder Soils in a Warmer World. And one of the speakers this morning alluded to this. It's uh, sort of counterintuitive, but as the climate warms and we have less snowpack, the snow insulates the ground. If we have less snowpack, even though the air temperature is warmer than it used to be, we actually are going to have more freezing because of less insulation. And so 
the I've got a couple years of we, we measure ground frost at Sleepers River and I've got a couple years shown here at, at different sites um, and so oops something like how do I go back well I, I, well, I skipped way ahead now sorry oh here we go wrong set of arrows Um, where the ground frost depth goes up to zero, that's because we had a big insulating snowpack right around there. And then when we get, uh, or that's when we, yeah. And then we get really deep ground frost after, that was a January thaw, so the snow went away, deep ground frost follows. So what's the deal about group of frost? Well, it really affects DOC and nitrate frost. Uh, we have a lot of fine root mortality, and um, <clears throat> that will end up leaching a lot of DOC and nitrate during the following uh, growing season. And we're eating into the question period, so I'm going to just go through the last few slides quickly. I'm switching to Puerto Rico, uh, but I just wanted to show that disturbance can cause a big flux of nitrate and then it takes a long time to recover. You see the, the nitrate concentrations in those colored curves of the uh, black vertical lines are hurricanes and it, you get a spike in nitrate and it goes away very slowly. We have an analog of the ice storm in 1998 where the same thing happened here. So I just, this is the best example I had of it. Um, and just one or two more. Uh, so this DOC increase that we're expecting to see from climate change has repercussions on other elements. DOC is really what drives mercury transports. The left plot shows the strong relation between mercury and DOC. And this is kind of a double whammy because we're expecting now to get more mercury transport, but as the temperature warms, a higher fraction of that mercury will become methylated into the form that rises up through the food web. And so um, it's kind of a double whammy for mercury. And I just, one last one where I want to touch on phosphorus because that's the big issue here in the Lake Champlain Basin. Uh, climate would be expected, climate change, to release legacy uh, phosphorus because of larger and more frequent storms and floods that erode uh, banks. And we get these gully washers that bring phosphorus off of the farm fields and that could lead to more uh, <clears throat> harmful algal blooms. Um, so I'll skip over this one, just talking about modeling as the way to look at things. And here's some model results. And you use biogeochemical models to look at nitrate, etc. And I'll just leave my conclusions up there, at least the ones that are showing. They're actually all there. Okay. Thanks. So she said a minute or two for questions. Neil. Hey, Jamie. That was great. It's on a good data. Um, Sleepers River, the DOC data, the frost data, the end data, flow data gives us a really awesome opportunity to look into nutrient like phosphorus dissolved in total discharge from those watersheds to explain why we're seeing the lipotropic lakes with all the undisturbed watersheds all over North America and in Vermont increasing in phosphorus. So, do you have that data, and if not, can uh, like Kelly Merrill over there help you uh, develop it? To have, if we have phosphorus data specifically, yeah, coming so off of the DOC, the increases in DOC, then and all that. Uh, very little, to be honest. Um, we measure it, and we often do not detect it. Uh, methods have gotten more sensitive lately, so we are starting to look at it. Um, I am just about to really, I have to publish our database, so I'm gonna be looking at that really carefully in the next couple of months, and I'll, I'll get with you on that, but, but thank you for, for the offer. Yes? Does the um, decrease in snowpack, is that gonna have an impact on stream heating? I'm sorry, on stream heating? Stream heating? Like over the course of the summer, does that have any correlation? 
of stream heating? Heating. Yeah. Um, I apologize to cut it off. I just want to stay on time. Oh, okay. But feel free definitely to congregate, especially during the social hour about that. That's a good question for it. But okay. thank you so much. Yes. See you.